In John chapter 12, let's start in verse 9. And as we're going through these verses today, we're only going to cover a few of the verses in John. No shock to you, I know. But we're going to be covering actually a lot of Scripture. But I want us to keep in mind three things. Today we're going to look at the, the impact of having an encounter and being converted by Jesus. We're going to be looking at Lazarus as a, a, a picture, an image, if you will, of what it means to be raised from the dead. Jesus was painting an illustration of something that's greater than being raised from the dead physically, but being raised from the dead spiritually. And Jesus is absolutely showing us through this gospel that I came to raise the dead to life. I came to give eternal life to take those who were spiritually dead and make them spiritually alive. And this is what a conversion is. And we, we get this in Lazarus because Jesus is conquering death. But when he conquers death through the raising of Lazarus, he conquers death through him being raised from the dead. What it's, what's happening is that death is the result of sin. He's conquering death. And he's conquering sin. And what is sin but brought about death, meaning it, it extinguishes life. So he's coming to heal the greater issue, and that's a spiritual issue. And we would fail to really benefit from this passage if we were to do like a Nicodemus and get caught up in the physical realm and say, well, how does one be born again? You go into the mother's womb, man, you're totally missing it, Nicodemus. Or even the, 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 uh, uh, the woman at the well in John chapter 4. We're going to look at that a little bit. But, but when Jesus said, I'll give you living water, she said, man, you ain't even got a bucket. How are you going to give? We don't want to look at this passage and miss the spiritual truth and the application that God would have us to learn from this. We that have been changed have been raised from the dead. I like the King James Version that says we've been quickened. That means we were dead and we were made alive. And we need, to, we need to acknowledge that, that we should live lives like Lazarus, someone who's been raised from the dead. So if we have been, if we've been converted, we've been raised from dead to life, then we should look at the impacts of that on our life. So number one, we're going to be observing of the, the impact of that conversion, the impact of following Jesus. Number two, we're going to be looking at the consequences, the consequences of following Jesus. And number three, the benefits of following Jesus. Looking at the impact, we're going to start at verse nine. Now, a great many of the Jews knew that he was there. That's a capital H because it's talking about Jesus. Now, a great many of the Jews knew that Jesus was there. Where? In Bethany. And they came not for Jesus' sake only. Get this. They came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. I love the fact that John doesn't even doesn't, doesn't make two cents or, or, or a hold back at all. He says, not only to see Jesus, but they wanted to see the one who was raised from the dead. They wanted to see Lazarus. I can only imagine what all they might would want to talk to him about. The questions that they might have. The Bible doesn't talk about any responses or if Lazarus was even aware of his presence or anything like that. But people wanted to come and see Lazarus. Well, of course they wanted to come see Lazarus. Man, when, we, when something amazing happens, we either go and turn on the TV or we run outside to see what's going on. We want to see for ourselves. And people wanted to see this person who was dead and now made alive. And I want you to know that that should be the same effect in our lives. If we have been made alive and we have been raised from dead to life, then people who knew us when we were dead, see these people knew Lazarus has died. If they didn't know Lazarus had died, or if they had not at least heard that Lazarus had died, there would be no great reason to come and see Lazarus. But like, man, this guy was dead, now he's alive. I want you to know that you who have been converted, you should be stirring up some attention in the community, in your family, in your friends, people that say, oh my goodness, something has changed and it should spark some curiosity. Ephesians chapter 2, it, it shows the impact on the individual. That's the first part of the impact we're going to look at. The impact of Jesus in your life in a conversion, what's the impact in your life? In Ephesians chapter 2, Let's look at Paul as he writes to the church 
at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2. We'll start in verse 1. And you who he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. He's saying, Paul is writing to the believers and he's saying, Hey, you bunch of Lazaruses, listen up. Okay? He's saying, you Lazaruses, listen up. Those of you who he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. He goes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paint what it looks like when you were dead, when you were Lazarus, when you were in the tomb and you were dead. You were dead. He says you were dead in trespasses and sin. And this is what you look like. This paints the impact. This is the impact. That having been raised from the dead should look like. And I want you to know this right there. If you are in this room and you call yourself a believer, you are saying that I have been raised from the dead. According to the biblical uh, scripture that's laid out right here in chapter 2 and verse 1, we begin. And we see that this is what it looks like. So those of you who are Lazarus, this raised from the dead, this is the impact it should have on your life. He says, you used to walk according to the course of this world. You went with the way of this world. What the world saw, what the world said was good, you thought it was good. What the world said was moral, you said it was moral. You went with the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Among, verse 3, among whom also we all once, we were all there, we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh. That's who you used to be. When you were dead, you did whatever you wanted to do. You did what you, your flesh desired to do. You had no moral spirit of God over you. Even if we learned how to behave ourselves in public and how to keep ourselves out of jail, you can try to kid yourself, but I know that I was as wretched as any wretched person you've ever read about in your history books. I know that apart from Christ, you would not want me in your life. Trust me. I, Steve, Steve just cares about Steve. Oh my goodness, am I opening the book on myself? That's fine. If you read the book on Steve apart from Christ and you don't want nothing to do with him, then you're not hurting my feelings. Because I don't want you to want to have anything to do with Steve. I want you to have to do with the spirit of Christ that's in me who now drives me and leads me. And I no longer walk according to the course of this world or my own lust and desires. But the spirit of God has made me new. So I hope that if you like or want to even be a part of my life and you appreciate and you love me, love me this new creature. Because you know what? That other one, he ain't got nothing for you. You don't need to love him. But love the one who God has created inside of me. So in verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when he, we were dead in trespasses and sin, this is past tense, made us alive together. We were dead and we were made alive. This is resurrecting. Okay, this is a resurrecting. Made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his Grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Let's turn just a little bit more in Ephesians to chapter 4. And we're going to look at the impact it's supposed to have on you if you have been raised from the dead. If you are an example of Lazarus. Chapter 4 of Ephesians, we'll start in verse 17. We read, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, but in, in the futility of their mind. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their hearts. That's who the, the world is, and that's who you were. Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work of all cleanly, uncleanliness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. This is not the Christ that you know and understand. You are not still walking in the flesh. You are not still uh, uh, consumed with your own desires. And walking as the world. You have not learned Christ this way. If, now, if you indeed, mean really actually, if you indeed have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. 
because that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. This is the impact on the individual. You used to be a wretched, filthy person. Now, I'm going to tell you something right now. There's a lot of people that just refuse to look at themselves that way. They don't. They they go to church to to help maybe even enhance their life as opposed to really seeing that, man, I'm broke and and, and I'm I'm in need of righteousness. I'm, I'm I'm, I'm bankrupt when it comes to holiness and righteousness and I need him. But a lot of people, they think I'm a pretty good person. Yeah, I should bring Jesus into my life. I should even make me even make me a better person. I'm going to tell you something. You're missing it. No, you are missing it. God did not come in your life. Jesus did not come in your life to season you, enhance you, and put some kind of vinaigrette, I don't know what they call them, little cropping thing on your photos to make you look a little bit better. No, you were ugly, you were filthy, and you're nasty, you were dead. He came to make you alive. Get a reality check. A lot of us just don't look at it like that. We think, you know, I was pretty good, now I'm better. Man, you're missing it. And I'm, I'm really concerned for you. If you see it that way, this is the impact on the individual. When Jesus comes into your life and he raises you from the dead and we become living Lazarus, then we should have an impact. There should be an impact on our lives. There should be an impact of him having raised us from the dead. And there should be consequences that come from it and benefits. But continuing on the impact, let's look at the impact it should have on others. That's the impact it should have on us. We looked at that. We were nasty. We were filthy. We get it, Steve. Now we are holy and righteous because we're in the holy righteous one. It's not of ourselves. Uh, uh, it, we get that. That's good if you got that. Now, here's a good way of, of, of looking and kind of checking your spiritual health. What did we just read? Paul says, well, if indeed you have actually been saved. You know what I'm saying? You know, if you actually have been raised from the dead, this is what it looks like. I like that because also when he writes to the church at Corinth, he says, hey, examine yourselves, see if you're even in the faith. So we ought to be looking. Now, how do we look? We look in the mirror of God's word. We look at the scriptures and the scriptures say this is what it's supposed to look like. If we look in the scriptures, now get this. If we look in the scriptures and we see what our life's supposed to look like and we don't see that happening in our lives, we should question like Paul says, or are you even in the faith? We're not saved by works, but works will be there. And if you look at the works, and there, there's no works there. There's no manifestation of being raised from the dead. You got to question whether you're still dead. Man, that's what the Bible says. I don't care what they teach in Bible college. This is what they teach in the Word. This is what Jesus taught. And this is what the apostles taught. What's the impact on others? Well, we actually see that in this passage here back into John. In John chapter 12 and verse 11, it says that, that, what does it say? Man, I didn't even put it in my, I guess I got to change back. Go and put it up here, John chapter 11. Because on account of him, this is the impact it had on others. Because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. That's a lowercase h there, so that's okay. On account of who? On account of Lazarus. On the fact that Lazarus had been raised from the dead. You know what? Lazarus can't take any credit for being raised from the dead, but he is now no longer dead. And it's apparent. Now, if we are no longer dead, then we look around in our lives, then we ought to see that we are no longer dead. And we saw what that looks like. Back to that verse, uh, verse 11. Because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. The impact that Jesus has in raising you from the dead and giving you life should stir attention. Whenever Joseph gave his life to the Lord, I know that I heard from other people that saying, hey, he's, he actually has changed. You know, a lot of people won't give you credit because you went to church three weeks in a row, but if you just continue to walk with the Lord, they say, hey, that wasn't just a spasm on a dead body. That happens in the morgue. It wasn't just some kind of spasm. No, this guy's up walking around. And he's walking. And I, and, and I know that we should have that in our lives. People should say, there is something different. That person is not who they used to be. They're not that dead person anymore. That should be evident in our life. And that impact can encourage others who realize, you know what? <laughs> my life is dead. My life is filthy. My life is undone. Well, you know what? If you have 
a, a death sentence on your life, which we all have because of sin. But you realize it. Let's say you come to understand that I'm in need. Then why, are, why wouldn't you go to the person that has already experienced that healing? Instead of just shooting in the dark trying to find it, you're going to go to Lazarus. And all those that are in, in Judea at this time, they all wanted to live forever. And we're going to look at that. They did. They wanted to live forever. And so if you see somebody, and there's sickness all around, there's people dying. They don't have the medical advancements that we have today. People die all the time. And so if they see somebody that actually has broken the seal of death and say, you have no hold on me or even on my friends. You know what? You want to want to go meet Jesus and you want to go meet him. And it says that people came not just for Jesus, but also for Lazarus. And that is something that we should have in our lives, an impact. We actually saw this in John chapter 4. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to turn back there real quickly. In John chapter 4, he's going to put it up there. When we, when we talked earlier about the woman at the well, I love the fact that this whole city of Samaria, or, or, or this whole city in Samaria, um, was pretty much converted. I mean, we don't know that it was every individual, but the city as a whole was converted over to Jesus. And they, they were originally, initially, the conversion began, and this mass change began because of one lowly, unqualified woman who had a testimony. A woman who, who, who had no business even talking in public because she was on the lowest rung of society. In those, in those societies, those, you didn't talk unless you had some kind of credibility with you. For one, the, the highest ones were the religious leaders because they had all the credentials and you should listen to me. And then you move on down the, the line, you're just the common uh, Jew, you know, yeah, you might listen to them. But you wouldn't necessarily listen to a woman, but you would listen to a, a regular Jewish man. But you keep on going down, and you definitely don't listen to a Samaritan. Those Samaritans are the scum of the earth. That's the way they looked at them. And you definitely don't listen to a Samaritan woman. They're even lower than the man, I'm telling you, about the society at that time. And then this woman had been with, with, uh, 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 married several times. And, that just, no, you don't listen. and yet this woman, this unqualified woman, is the one that went and declared who Jesus is. And we see in verse... 39, John chapter 4 and verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him, believed in Jesus, because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. His own word, meaning many believed because of her word, but many more believed of his own word after they came and seen for himself. Now, I love that they said this in verse 42. Then they said to the woman, now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him. And we know that this is indeed the Christ, the savior of the world. This is the impact that, uh, that Jesus should have on our lives. Not only does it change and convince us and convert us. But people that we come in contact with, and the people that knew us or know us, should be, able to be be, should be able to testify that God is in us and have made a change in us. This is the impact of what it looks like for those who have been converted. If you consider or call yourself a Christian disciple of Jesus Christ, you are a modern-day Lazarus, one who was dead and trespasses in sin and has now been made alive in Christ Jesus. Is that the impact that you see in your life? And I want you to ask yourself that this morning. Let's look at the consequences of following, being converted, being raised from the dead by Jesus. In verse 10, but the chief priest, back to John chapter 12. But the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also. Because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. There it is again, verse 11. I knew I had it in my notes right here. Because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. And so Jesus has been leading many of the people. He says just those that are his sheep. But many of the people that were his sheep. And there were a lot of people that were just kind of following along. And we're going to see that next week. A lot of people that were just kind of following along that weren't real followers. Not real disciples of Jesus. We see that. But the people were being moved to follow Jesus. And so what did they say? We looked at this in, in chapter 11. They said, we got to kill him. 
We've got to kill him. We're losing the people. We're losing our base. We're losing our congregation. We're losing our, 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 our funding, I mean, our, our people that, you know, we get money from. We're, we're, we're losing those who glorify us and look up to us. We're losing the people. Jesus got to go. So they plotted to kill Jesus, and we looked at that. And here it says, And the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. It does not say anything about Lazarus' ability to evangelize. You notice that? It doesn't say anything about how good a preacher Lazarus was. Lazarus, all he had done, man, is he got sick and he died. And then whenever he was dead, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. So he just got up and came forth. So far, all we know since that time, he's just eating down, sitting down having a meal with Jesus earlier in this chapter. And yet now he's got a death sentence on him. Good luck killing the guy that God raised from the dead. Evidently, maybe God will let him die when it's time for him to die, but God has control over that. And so they now, just because there has been a transformation, he's going to pay the price. But we saw the impact of being transformed, being raised from the dead, and walking in newness of life. The impact on our lives and also the impact it'll have on other people's lives. And I want you to know this, that if you think, for one, you should be very concerned if you think this, if you think that you can live your life and not have an impact on any, anybody else, you're, you're evidently not reading the Bible. But if you think you can do that, then I would almost agree with you that, you know what? The chief priest may not want to kill you. You know, the, 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 the enemy, the devil wickedness in high places may not come after you because you're not a threat to lose the people. You know what? The enemy's always been in the game of stealing God's people. That's what's happening right here with the, with the religious leaders. They're in the habit. They want to steal God's people. They can't. Jesus says this, man, my sheep are going to follow me. Those that are my sheep are going to follow me. Those that are following the, the, the world, they're not his sheep. And so the, the, if, 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 you are having an impact because if you're changed life and other people are you're in, impacting other people's life, then you are going to be afflicted and persecuted. And Jesus says, hey, don't think you're above it because I went through it, too. So it says in verse 10, but the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. Lazarus life in itself was a threat to the enemy's followers, and they must deal with him in the same way they dealt with Jesus. Well, I want you to know that. The way they dealt with Jesus, if you are truly a Lazarus, a modern-day Lazarus who's been raised from the dead, then you know what? The enemy's going to want to uh, kill you just like he killed Jesus. Well, you know, maybe maybe not necessarily take your life. I'm sure he'd like to do that. But not necessarily just take your life, but just to take your life. What, that don't make no sense, Steve. No, I'm talking about to make you where you aren't a witness of being raised from the dead. You know, where, where if, if, if Joseph, whose life has been transformed, if he goes back to that lifestyle, then why would the enemy want to do anything to cause Joseph any pain or affliction? Matter of fact, he might start jo stuffing Joseph's pockets with, with money and, and, and cars or whatever. So Joseph is like, man, this is working out great. Yeah, just keep dead. Stay dead. Don't show a transformed life to the world. Because if you show a transformed life, those who are desperate for life will come to you and ask. Just like they came to Lazarus. And if we are true followers of Jesus, then there's going to be consequences for it. Matter of fact, in John chapter 15, we'll turn over there quickly. John chapter 15. In John chapter 15... Jesus says this in verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of this world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, because I chose you out of this world, therefore the world hates you. Did you know you're signing up to be hated when you said, I want to be with Jesus? I want to be a Christian. I want to be a disciple. I want to be a follower of Jesus. I want to be baptized. All these things. Did you know that you were signing up that the world would hate you? Jesus says, hey, man, it's a fact. Jesus did not ever intend to trick you into being a Christian and you find out later what was in the package. 
No, he said, weigh out the cost of discipleship. And you know what this whole Bible is? It's saying this is what the cost is. Did you know that? Well, a lot of people don't know that when they find out the cost. They say, whoa, whoa, I don't want any part of that. You know, some people can say, well, that person was saved and backslid and left. I don't care what you call it. What I call it is Jesus was never shocked by it. I don't think Jesus goes, man, I thought he was sincere. I think Jesus really knows. I think he knows whenever he says, man, yeah, they're saying that they want to be with me, but they love the world too much. They love the world. They're not willing to, to give up the world's affections. They, we, we saw it in this, in this very book right here where, where the, 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 in chapter 13, uh, whenever the religious leaders, many of the religious leaders believed on Jesus, but for fear of the Jews or for, for fear of the Pharisees and the love that they had for people to glorify them, they loved themselves more than they loved God, and so they didn't follow Jesus. They didn't confess to Jesus. Jesus was not surprised by that, and he's not surprised by those who, when it comes to the world hating them, oh, wait a second, I'm not going to. Well, he says in verse 8, in chapter 18. <coughs> Excuse me, chapter 15. Remember the word, verse 20. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. You, you think you're greater than me? They hated me, but they're going to love you? No, if you're my servant, they're not going to love you because they hated me. You think you're greater than your servant? The, 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 you think they're great, you're greater? Your servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word... They will keep yours also. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. You remember what we read over in John 8, 31? Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Those that abide in his word, those that abide in Jesus, those that continue in following Jesus, those are going to be persecuted by the world. They should not be persecuted by fellow world believers. Let's get that right and repent of that if we're doing that. But the world will hate you and they will persecute you. There is a consequence to following Jesus. We ought to look at ourselves this morning and look at our lives and say, can I, can I recognize the impact of a changed life going from being dead in trespasses and sin. I used to walk after my own desires and do the things that I wanted to do. Can I see now that I'm not doing that anymore? Can I see now that I'm now following Jesus and what he wants is what I do? This is a transformed life of being moved. This is the impact on me. Is this impact spreading over into others also? See, because if, you're, if the first thing that we're looking at is the impact, the impact on our lives and then the impact on others, there's going to have a positive impact on those who desire to be raised from the dead also, and those who want to walk in the light. But it's going to have a negative impact and bring into your life persecution if you begin to walk in newness of life and shine a light and those who want to stay dead and stay in darkness. They're going to hate you. They're going to come back against you. I just want you to know what Jesus is saying right here. In short, this. You're going to impact lives, good and bad. And if all, if all your life is doing is impacting, when I say good and bad, it's a good impact that you are showing them the light, but the, it's bad in their part, they're going to reject you. So the impact and the consequences are tied together. You're going to impact people's lives, and you're going to pay the consequences for it. If you're not suffering any consequences for following Jesus, Jesus, in his own words, says you will. So what does that mean about you if he says that you will suffer these consequences and you ain't? Well, maybe it's because you're a new believer yet and he's still got you protected and he's got this as he's growing you. That's fine. I'm going to tell you something. You better be prepared for it. And you better be able to notice whenever you're compromising the gospel because you don't want the world to hate you. Or you're compromising the Bible because you don't want the consequences that come with it. One who's been transformed and raised from the dead. There's an impact on your life and an impact on other people's lives. Some people will come because they want life and some people will persecute you because they want to stay in darkness and in death. That's pretty gloomy, Steve. It is gloomy, but... It's the reality. It's the truth. But you know what's all worth it? And that's what we're going to look at now. The benefits of following Jesus. John chapter 5. This just really sums it up here. John chapter 5 and verse 38. 
But you do not, Jesus says this, but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent him you do not believe. You search the scriptures. He's talking to those that are rejecting them. He says, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And yet these, the scriptures, are they which testify me of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. What did Jesus just say? He's saying, you are searching the scriptures. Of course, they're missing it because the scriptures point to Jesus and they're rejecting Jesus. But what does he say they're searching the scriptures for? Eternal life. You think that in them you have eternal life. So they're searching for eternal life. I want you to know something right now. I believe, absolutely believe with all my heart. And it's not just because of my personal opinion. I believe because of God and his intent and his design and creation that everyone wants eternal life. Now, a lot of people don't realize they want eternal life because they have a skewed or distorted uh, concept of life in general. But don't don't confuse their sickness and inability to understand life with the fact that they don't want eternal life. The reality is that they would want eternal life if they understood and knew what it was. But there's something inside of us that wants eternal life, but not just for any reason. We're going to look at that. But Jesus says you want eternal life. And here's, here's the great thing. He says in verse 40, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. He says, but I got it. You want eternal life and you're looking for it, but you're missing it. But he says, I have it. But Jesus says, I came. This is the purpose. We've been reading through this gospel and through all the gospel, all four of the gospels, that the message of Jesus Christ is to come and to give eternal life. But do we really want a eternal life? One of the questions we asked when we were doing interviews on the streets was, does anybody, you know, do you want to live forever? Do you want eternal life? Some people were like, well, yeah, absolutely. Some people were like, well, I don't know if I'd want to live forever. Well, you know what? They, you could hear in the, in the things they said all uh, right after that, they had a distorted understanding of what eternal life is. We're going to look at the right perspective on eternal life, but let's make sure that we understand. And we're going to go through these quickly. That this is Jesus' purpose in his ministry. John chapter 3, verse 36. He says this. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides him. Next verse. Abides in him. John chapter 6, and verse 27. John chapter 6, verse 27. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. Remember he told the woman at the well? I give you water that you that you'll never thirst again. She's like, oh, regular water? No. <laughs> Don't labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. This is Jesus. He is the bread of life. He is eternal life. He brings eternal life. That's his purpose, which is the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. This is what the Father sent the Son to do to give eternal life. This is a message of the gospel right here. It's the purpose. John chapter 10, verse 28. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Next verse, John 3.16. This is the one we've all memorized since we were kids, for, since we were children. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That Why? That whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the purpose. He came to give everlasting life. And you know what? That's a benefit that's worth enduring any of the consequences. The eternal life, the gift of eternal life. Well, is that really what Jesus came for, is eternal life? Not only is it what Jesus came for, but the apostles came to confirm all this. And let's look at what the apostles wrote. In Romans chapter 6, 23, Paul writes this, For the wages of sin is death. The result of us having sin in our lives, being fallen, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul writes this in Romans. In 1 John 5, this same apostle who wrote the Gospel of John writes in 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son, verse 12, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Next verse, Romans 5, 21. 
so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, we could go on and on, but let's look at this last one in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9. And having been perfected, he became the author, who Jesus became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. This is the message. God is eternal, and he wants to give you of his eternalness so that you can be eternal too. This is the message of the gospel. This is the good news. This is the benefit. So nothing that we have to pay as a consequence in this life, having been changed and received eternal life, nothing that we pay as a price for persecution can compare to the fact that he has given us eternal life. We have God for eternity. But why? Why would we want eternal life? Why would anybody want to live forever? Here's the answer to that question. is because they want to be reconciled with God. They want to be with God. This is why we want, I want you to know why you want eternal life. You don't want eternal life just because you don't like the thought of dying. You don't want eternal life just because you want to be invincible and not be mortal. We put off uh, mortality for immortality. That's true. But it's not because of that we want to be immortal. It's not because, no, why do we want eternal life? It's because we want to be with Him forever. You know, people say this, it sounds romantic, and they've been written, they've written songs about it, whatever. I wouldn't, well, life ain't worth living without you, sweetheart, you know. I wouldn't even want to live without you. My life would be worth nothing without you. Yet you got all these maybe 40 and 50 years and 70 years worth of life yet to live, but you just can't imagine it being any good without that dear sweetheart of yours. Well, there's some reality to that in that I, I don't, I don't want to imagine a Michelle not being in my life. I love her. I don't want to imagine a day without her. I don't ever need a break from Michelle. I really don't. I know sometimes couples say, I need a break, whatever. I need to give... I, I don't need a break from Michelle. Maybe she needs a break from me. I don't know. But I don't ever say, man, I've just, I've been around Michelle too much. I love my life with her. I love spending my life with her. But you know what I like even more? I love spending my life with God. And I am grateful that I never have to have an expiration on that. It's the great thing that you never want to end. The, the, think of the best movie you ever watched and you didn't even want to walk out the theater. You did not want it to end. It was so awesome. You could have sat there forever in that moment and just never, ever leave it. Think of that's what it's like with God. And God says, if you want me, it will never end. It will never end. That's the thing about eternal life. We get to be with God forever. If we're missing that, we're missing the point of eternal life. One of my favorite authors, he's been dead for a long time, but he's spiritually alive. A.W. Tozer, he wrote this in The Pursuit of God. I, I love this. He says, we pursue God because and only because he has first put an urge within us <coughs> that spurs us to the pursuit. No man can come to me, said our Lord, except the Father uh, which has sent him, sent me draw him. That's from John six forty four. And it is by this very prevenient drawing that God takes from us every vestige of credit for the act of coming. The impulse to pursue God originates with God, but the outworking of that impulse is our following hard after him. And all the time we're pursuing him, we are already in his hand. Thy right hand is told for me. But we pursue God because and only because he has first put an urge within us that spurs us to the pursuit. I love that. I like that. And I, I believe that. I agree with that. I'm going to put it in a term that you, you've probably heard. God creates a God-shaped hole in your life that cannot be filled by anybody else and will always leave you feeling incomplete, lacking, thirsty, and hungry unless He fills it. He created that in us. Every one of us. Every one of us, He created that God-shaped hole saying, you will never. And this, the great thing is, I, I like the way that A.W. Tozer is, is, don't take credit for it. <laughs> because had he not created that God-shaped hole, you would not have no desire to have it filled. So he, he receives all the glory and honor. We should actually praise God for saying, thank you for making me incomplete without you. 
Yeah, we should thank we should praise God. Thank you for creating me needing you. God created us with that God shaped hole. And if we go through this life and we know even those who don't walk with Jesus, even those who reject them, they have a hole that they try to fill with everything that's not the shape of God. They try to fill it with money. They try to fill it with women. They try to fill it with drugs, with alcohol, with whatever. They tr- Look, they do it. <coughs> Even people in the world <laughs> who say, man, I've done everything and I'm still unhappy. People say that. Talk about people who've had money, who've had, who've had whatever. And they say, man, it, did never not, it never satisfied. You know why? Because <laughs> it wasn't the right shape. It wasn't God-shaped. And we praise God that he created us with a God-shaped hole that we would desire. And you know what eternity life is? He says, I fill it and you'll never want to be without me. That's the gift of eternal life. It's the gift of being with him forever. Does that even interest us? If that's not something that interests us, we may want to question, why are we? Are we just looking for a ticket out of hell? You think that's the depth of the gospel? You think God's that shallow? Really? He didn't have to create hell. No, the prize is him. The prize is not freedom from the punishment. The prize is him. Don't don't miss the forest for the trees. You've got a God-shaped hole. I pray this morning that we would look at our lives and say, have I been impacted by Jesus? Have I went from dead to life? Are the consequences something that's in my life? And am I willing to pay the consequences? Count the cost of discipleship. Count the cost of following Christ. There's going to be consequences. Would you stand with me this morning?